بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Maytham al-Tammar occupies a prominent position in the religion of Islam as being revered as one of the greatest companions of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahu wa salamuhu alayhi A man from whose life many a lesson may be learnt and many an example may be derived and indeed, a man whose life affects each and every one of our lives today. A man who is seen as the embodiment of passion, bravery, patience and valor, and revered by many as one of the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When you read much of Islamic literature, you find that when the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib are mentioned, Maytham is always amongst them. As in there are always four disciples who are mentioned. Malik al-Ashtar, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, Uwais al-Qarani, and Maytham al-Tammar. And indeed, there's a need for us to examine his life in depth. For there are many extraordinary lessons to be learned from his life, which easily apply to our lives today. As in when we dissect the topic concerning Maytham al-Tammar's biography, two important issues emerge from the outset. Number one, there is a need for us to increase the number of books which are written on these great personalities. As in you find, there is very little literature in relation to the companions of the Imams of Al Muhammad. Many of these companions were the ones who protected the legacy of the Imams, as in many of these companions were the ones who from themselves gave back to the Imams, looked after their teachings, narrated to us their sayings, on many occasions, we would not know the words of the Imams were it not for these companions. As in these companions were walking books on earth. And as we know very clearly, the Prophet would mention, the ink of the scholar is greater than the blood of the martyr. As in a scholar keeps a community alive through the ink which he used to narrate the traditions of those who came before him. Unfortunately, today you will be hard pressed to find one book which gives you the whole biography of Maytham al-Tammar. And yet when you study Maytham's life, not only is his life colossal, you'll find that his six sons were amongst the greatest companions of our fourth Imam, of our fifth Imam. His grandsons were amongst the greatest companions of our sixth Imam and our seventh Imam. In other words, the legacy of Maytham is a legacy which has to be written it's a shame when you find in the English language today that there is hardly any literature on the likes of Maytham al-Tammar, on the likes of Amr bin Hamak al-Khuzai, 
on the likes of Rochelle al Hajari, on the likes of Habib ibn Mazahir. Therefore, on the first level, we need to begin to reassess where, why we are not printing literature on these great personalities. Number two, when we study the biography of Maytham, the reason we study is to reflect upon whether we've sacrificed for Islam like Maytham sacrificed for this religion. As in sometimes there are some of us over here who are going through a free ride in terms of our religious, religiosity. You'll find in the month of Muharram, in the month of Ramadan, many of us start sacrificing. In between those months, there are certain people you'll never see in the mosque whatsoever. You ask them why, they say to you, because my schedule is busy. When you read Maytham al Tamar, the aim of reading Maytham is to ask ourselves that the sacrifices Maytham made in his life, have we made these sacrifices as well? As in if I want to be raised with Al Muhammad, like the verse says, I do not ask from you anything except love for my family. Have we given this love duly back to Al Muhammad? As in, have we honored their status or no? When we read about the likes of Maytham, we use Maytham as a barometer. If not a barometer, we use Maytham as a mirror for us in our lives. To be able to ask ourselves, are we a reflection of this man or not? Have we maintained his legacy or not? Let's dissect Maytham's biography importantly because Maytham was killed a couple of weeks before the 10th of Muharram. Therefore, we need to ask ourselves, how was Maytham amongst the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen? What did Amir al-Mu'mineen teach Maytham? How close was Maytham to Habib ibn Madahir and Mukhtar? What did Maytham tell Mukhtar about what would happen after Karbala? And importantly, how does the assassination of Maytham al Tamar and his execution highlight to us what Ibn Marjana did in Kufa? And how did Ibn Marjana end the life of Muslim Ibn Aqil? Let's examine this and dissect this topic in complete depth. When you come to examining Maytham, the first area of the examination is to look at the position of Kufa and Najaf in Islamic history. Why? Because we know that the biography of Maytham and Tamar begins when? Maytham and Tamar's biography begins in the land of Kufa. The land of Kufa and the land of Najaf has a history unparalleled within the religion of Islam. As in, within academic circles, you'll find that that area of land is normally given three names. Either it is called Kufa, or it is called Najaf, or it is called Hira. Christians, when they'd refer to Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he was in Kufa, Christians would say he is the Amir of Hira. Hira was known as that area which surrounded Kufa and Najaf. As in those of you who've been to Kufa will know, Kufa and Najaf is within <coughs> 20 minutes or so of each other. You therefore find that that area was an area of great history. An area where many of the prophets of Allah stood on. Many of them sat, many of them lived. And therefore it's no surprise that this will be the area where the Imam of our time lives as well, isn't it? As in the Imam of our time, many believe his house will be in Masjid al-Sahla in Kufa. Or that area near Masjid al-Sahla. You find for example, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam would visit the land of Najaf and Kufa with his son. When he entered the land, there was an earthquake in that area for a while. When he entered it, the earthquake stopped. Many of the people said, you are a blessing to our, our land, O Prophet Ibrahim. He replied that no, this land is a blessing. And he bought the land within the land of Najaf. You find, for example, the narrations mentioned Najaf and Kufa was also a port for the Chinese. The Chinese, in their journeys of bringing exports and imports within, you will find that if they moved within the east and the west, one of the ports which they stopped at was the port of Najaf. As the Najaf was originally a sea area, if you look at the idea of Nay, the idea of that sea which became Jaff. Jaff means dry. Hence the idea of Najaf is the Nay Jaff, the dry sea. The Chinese would come, the Chinese would come, they would have it as a port. Nabi Ibrahim would be there. And you'd find even Christians were living in the land of Kufa and Najaf many years before Amir al-Mu'mineen went there. As in there used to be a settlement of houses by the name of Ukairah. 
Ukaira, what does it mean? Ukaira is a settlement of houses where monks used to stay. That's why when you read Kufan history, you'll find there were four languages that used to be spoken in Kufa. Arabic, you'll find Syrian, you'll find Persian and Greek. Four different languages were spoken in that city in its history. As in sometimes when you hear about Kufa, all you imagine is Arabic. You imagine the people of Kufa that they only spoke Arabic. No, on the contrary, the people of Kufa were made up of people coming either traveling or either it was a garrison town for an army to stop. That's why Kufa, when it was founded by Umar ibn al-Khattab, when Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas had gone past this area, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said, this is an area for a settlement. As in this area of Kufa, like the area of Najaf, people should settle here. And that's why you found, because of its great history, Ali ibn Abi Talib decided to move his capital from Medina to Kufa. As in sometimes people ask the question, why did Imam Ali move from Medina to Kufa? Why didn't Imam Ali keep Medina as the capital? There were two reasons. The first reason is Ali ibn Abi Talib had to keep a watchful eye on Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was in charge of the area of Sham. The area of Sham, today Sham is Syria, isn't it? As in when you hear the word Sham today, what does Sham mean? Syria. When you read it in Islamic literature, Sham doesn't mean Syria. Sham means Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan. As in you think Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan could last with Ali ibn Abi Talib if he was only in charge of Syria? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan at Syria, Lebanon, Palestine and Jordan all under him. Bilad al-Sham was four countries, not one. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib moved to Kufa. That was the first reason. But the second reason was Kufa was a, a city ripe with heritage, ripe with culture. And that's why I always say, those who say the people of Kufa, they're the cause of the killing of Imam al-Hussein. What are you trying to blame Ali ibn Abi Talib? You're trying to blame Ali ibn Abi Talib for his decision making? Because someone can turn around and say, Ali ibn Abi Talib's fault. Why did Ali ibn Abi Talib choose the people who aren't good? I always say, do not generalize on people. In any city, you'll find the good and you'll find the bad. Don't open a mouth when your historical knowledge is fickle because there's too many fickle speakers these days. When you find them coming forward and saying, the people of Kufa are the killers of Hussein ibn Ali. What do you mean the people of Kufa? Be specific when you discuss these issues. Ali ibn Abi Talib felt Kufa was ripe for him to build his caliphate in that area. What happened afterwards doesn't mean that the whole people are bad. There are certain circumstances which I'll come to in a minute. Therefore, when Imam Ali settled in Kufa, he settled with his family in the land of Kufa, right next door to Masjid al-Kufa. May Allah bless you the ziyara of Masjid al-Kufa. Go to Masjid al-Kufa, you'll see the whole of Islamic history in one mosque. As in, if you leave that mosque within two hours, you have not appreciated history. The whole of Islamic history is in that mosque. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to live next door. Ali ibn Abi Talib would go out and earn himself a living. He wouldn't take the money of the caliph. If he took the money as a stipend of a caliph, he'd give it out to the poor. Otherwise, he'd go and earn his own income. And that's why you find it's vital that a person does not see it as embarrassing for them to go out and earn their own income, isn't it? As in you find Prophet Idris was a tailor. Prophet Musa was a shepherd. Prophet Jesus was a carpenter. The Holy Prophet worked under Khadija. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen would go out, he'd earn his living. And what else would he do? He'd look around if there were any slaves. Why? Because in his time in Kufa, there were slaves who were known as Mawali. Or they were known as Mawla. What's a Mawla? A Mawla is someone who's originally of a Persian origin, who was a slave living in Kufa. You found that Ali ibn Abi Talib would go around the land of Kufa, if he saw a slave, he'd try and free the slave so they can live their life. So what he would earn, he'd pay for the slave to be freed. One day he's walking. He sees a lady from Bani Asad. And next to her, there is a particular slave. He comes near her and he says, Oh lady, I want to buy that slave that you have working for you. She said, who, Salim? He said, yes. She said, why do you want to buy him? He said, no, I just believe that I think it's someone I can purchase at the right price. You tell me the price, I'll purchase. She said, 50 dinar and you'll have Salim. 
He looked at her and he said, here is 50 dinar. She thought if he's that willing to give 50, then why not raise the stakes? As an Iraqis can be good businessmen. You find that if it's 50, then raise the stakes. So she raised it to 100. He said, here's 100. She said, 150. He said, here's 150. 200. He said, here's 200. The companions looked at Amir al-Mumin and said, Ya Amir al-Mumin, who's this guy? As in this guy, what is he? He's originally a Persian. He's a slave. What's the point of paying this much? She said, 250. Here's 250. 300. Here's 300. She went all the way up to 500. He paid her 500. He said, that's how much I want him. He came towards him. And when he came towards him, she said, Salim, come here. This person has purchased you. He said to him, Salamu alaykum, Maytham. He looked at him and said, what did you say? He said, Salamu alaykum, Maytham. He said, nobody knows my name except my parents. How did you know my name? He said to him, do not worry. There are areas of knowledge I may know which you do not know. He said to him, come near me. He said, I want you to come with me. He said to him, how did you know my name? There is no one in Kufa who knows me by Maytham. My mother named me Maytham. Only a person of great knowledge knows that that's my original name. He said to him, come with me, do not worry. And it did turn out that Ali ibn Abi Talib for years in Kufa had waited to find Maytham at Tamar for years in his life. Why? Because Maytham, when he meets Umm Salama later on, before he's killed, Umm Salama looks at him and says, who are you? He says, Ana Maytham at Tamar, I am Maytham at Tamar. She said to him, how blessed a man you are. He said to her, why? Listen to the line. She said, do you know how many nights I heard Rasulullah praising you in front of Ali bin Abi Talib? In other words, Ali bin Abi Talib from a young age was waiting for Maytham. She said, Rasulullah in the middle of the night would tell Ali, Ali, do you know you're going to have some loyal companions? And of those loyal ones, you'll have Maytham at Tamar. He will be a loyal companion like none other. Therefore, Maytham at Tamar, Ali ibn Abi Talib took him under his wing. He removed him from the shackles of slavery. And you find Maytham said, only Allah knows what lessons I learned from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, I didn't find a human on this earth like Amir al muminin For example, he narrates, he says, if you want to see the embodiment of humility, then see what I saw with Ali ibn Abi Talib. In which way? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the Khalifa of the Muslim state. I'm a Tamar. Tamar, what does Tamar mean? Tamar means dates, isn't it? Maytham al Tamar would have a market stall where he would sell dates. He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib taught us the first lesson in life. That whatever job you have as a human being, if you're earning wealth in halal, it's a worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Amir al muminin would come and sit by me. I would be there, I'd sell dates. He'd come and sit near me. He said, which king would sit next to a man selling dates? He said, whereas Ali ibn Abi Talib would come, he'd sit near me. He said, look at the humility of the man. One day, Ali ibn Abi Talib said to me, Maytham, go and have a break. Go and pray your salah. I'll look after your date stall. So Maytham at that moment said, very well. He said, I went and I told Amir al-Mu'mineen, try and sell a few dates if you could sell anything. Amir al-Mu'min looked at him, he said, do not worry, just go and pray. Someone came and he bought some dates from Ali ibn Abi Talib. The money he gave Ali ibn Abi Talib when he bought these dates were known as bitter money. Bitter money means what? It means fake money, something which is not real. So as soon as he bought this, Ali ibn Abi Talib took the money, the person went away, made them, came back. He said to him, Ya Amir al muminin did you manage to sell? <coughs> he said to him, yes, I managed to sell. He said, how much? He said, I managed, alhamdulillah, to sell four dates. <clears throat> he said, where's the money? He said, here's the money. <clears throat> as soon as he showed him the money, he looked towards the money and said, Imam, this person's giving you bitter money. It's not real. Imam said, Maytam, sit down, do not worry. Allah will provide risk. That man suddenly returned. He looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to him, oh, son of Abu Talib, give me my money back. He said to him, why? He says, these dates that you've given me, they taste bitter. He said, because the money you gave us was bitter. <coughs> Ali bin Abi Talib. In his own league when it comes to this world.
So you found therefore that the humility was unbelievable. The humility was there that he said we learned lessons from Amir al-Mu'mineen. And that's why the narrations mentioned that Ali ibn Abi Talib would tell Maytham. He said to Maytham, remain loyal with me and I'll teach you the mysteries of this world. Imam al-Sadiq salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Imam al-Sadiq used to say, Maytham al-Tammar, the secrets that Ali ibn Abi Talib taught him were equivalent to the secrets Allah gave some of his messengers were equivalent to the secrets Allah gave the most close angels. And it's because Maytam had a heart which could contain these secrets. As in truly, if a person has a pure heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I will place my arsh in the heart of the mu'min. Isn't it? Don't we have a hadith? Qalb al-mu'min, arsh al-Rahman. The heart of the mu'min is where Allah puts his throne. Meaning what? Not literally. Meaning that when a human being is in obedience to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let him see what is normally unseen. You find Maytham al-Tamar says, when I was of the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib, when I was loyal to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib would reveal to us secrets of this earth. But he said, do you know what, were the, what was the keys to these secrets? The salah of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib's salah is the reason Allah showed him things others couldn't see. You know, once they asked Amir al muminin they said to him, do you prefer to be in a mosque praying to Allah or do you prefer to be in heaven? He replied, I prefer to be in a mosque praying to Allah. They said to him, why? He said, because in a mosque, Allah is pleased with me. Whereas in heaven, I am pleased with myself. You find therefore, Amir al muminin would love these prayers. Maytham would say, when he'd go towards Masjid al-Ju'fi. Masjid al-Ju'fi is still in Kufa today. You'll visit it on your ziyarah. He said, when Ali ibn Abi Talib would go to Masjid al-Ju'fi, we'd follow him. He'd pray his salah. He'd pray a four rak'ah of salah. The secret wasn't just the salah. As soon as he finishes the salah, He'd raise his hands to Allah and 100 times he would say, Al-Af, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. O oh, son of Abu Talib, what do you have to be sorry about? As in if I said sorry, it's understandable. But when Ali ibn Abi Talib sits in front of his companions and says sorry, he was teaching them a lesson that even me in my position, I still feel I haven't done justice to the generosity of my Lord. Isn't it? As in, in Salat al-Layl, isn't it narrated that in Salat al-Layl we should say, and I recommend all of you brothers and sisters to recite Salat al-Layl in these nights, if you can recite just Salat al-Wit, just one ruk'ah. It's narrated in Salat al-Wit, say al-Af. Do you know what al-Af means? It means, Ya Allah, when I'm praying to you, I'm saying sorry for every sin I can remember. One narration says, say sorry a hundred times in Salat al-Layl. Ya Allah, I'm sorry for the arrogance I showed your creation. Ya Allah, I'm sorry for the hatred I show my family. Ya Allah, I'm sorry for the rudeness I've shown my mother or the disrespect I've shown my father. Ya Allah, I'm sorry that all these years I've listened to the majalis of Zainab, but I haven't worn the hijab of Zainab. Ya Allah, I'm sorry that I've listened to the musicians and have neglected your Quran. How many things do we have to say sorry about, isn't it? Realistically, aren't there a number of things we have sorry? Maytam would say, Ali ibn Abi Talib would pray as soon as the salah finishes. First dua, al-af, 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 a hundred times. Then when he'd finish 100 times sorry, said after that, he'd say, now my dear companions, I'm going to go into that desert field. Leave me alone. Allow me to go by myself. He said, I, the lover of Amir al muminin could not bear to see him alone. Because how do I know someone may come who has hatred towards me and attack him? He said, I'd see him from far away. I wouldn't know what he's doing. He said, I'd go near him. He said, one day I go, went towards him. Ali turned around to me. He said, Maytham, what are you doing here? He said, oh, son of Abu Talib, I couldn't bear that you're alone. What if something happens to you? I love you. I can't stay away from you. <clears throat> do you know what he said at that moment? He said to him, Maytham, do you know why I come out in the desert or not? He said to him, no, tell me. He said, Maytham, I have so many mysteries in my heart. I have no one to give these to. So what I do is to remove these burdens in my heart. I dig my fist into the earth. So I plant the mysteries in my heart into the earth. Meaning what? 
Meaning I'm living at a time when I ask people, I say to them, ask me before you lose me. And the person asks me, how many hairs do I have in my beard, O son of Abu Talib? Instead of asking me about the secrets of the world, about the origin of this universe, cosmological, metaphysical issues, instead they ask me, how many hairs in my beard? How many hairs in my hair? Maytham, I go out alone in the desert. And you know, for Ali to say this to Maytham, shows you how high Maytham is, isn't it? Ali bin Abi Talib shouldn't say this to anyone, it's his own secret. Says make them, there are mysteries. I dig the earth with my fist to plant the mysteries in the earth. Because of the sadness I see the people neglecting my position as their leader. They neglected him. Three years, four years, Ali ibn Talib was caliph. Three civil wars against him. So make them would say, we'd stay loyal to Amir al muminin And that's why he said, Ali ibn Abi Talib taught us a science. A science which was known with make them Tamar. What was it? علم البلايا والمنايا. Someone says, what's علم البلايا والمنايا? The knowledge of the trials and the knowledge of death. What do we mean? Maytham al-Tamar is the embodiment of the verse in the Quran in Ayat al-Kursi. In Ayat al-Kursi, don't we say, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ Nobody has access to Allah's knowledge except those who Allah chooses, isn't it? Maytham al-Tamar is that embodiment that Ali ibn Abi Talib gave knowledge to Maytham, which nobody else had access to. Which knowledge? Knowledge of when certain people are going to die. Ali ibn Abi Talib gave Maytham this knowledge. And also knowledge of the trials of suffering that some people may face. You know, sometimes people say to me, how do the Imams know about when their death is? The Imams are amongst people who Allah chose to give knowledge of trials and death because he knew they had the patience to look after this knowledge. Maytham al-Tamar, Ali ibn Abi Talib taught him certain secrets of knowledge which remained with him in his discussions. Let's look at some of them and how they affected Islamic history. One area of knowledge is Maytham one day saw Habib ibn Madahir. When he saw Habib ibn Madahir, Habib looked at him. He said to him, oh Maytham, please listen to this line. He said to him, oh Maytham, it's as if I see a bold man with a round stomach selling dates and watermelons and he will be killed by the son of an illegitimate birth will you be ready on that day or will you denounce ali bin abi talib from your life maytham said it would be my honor to protect the message of ali bin abi talib from this man then maytham turned around to habib he said habib it's as if i see a man who comes from Kufa to defend the grandson of Rasulullah at Karbala. Are you ready for that day? Or will you leave the grandson alone? He said, I'll be ready to stand alongside Abba Abdullah on that day. The people thought these two are crazy. <clears throat> As in one saying about his death, the other saying about his death. So do you know who the people went to? Rashid al-Hajari. Rashid al-Hajari. His sister was married to Amr ibn Hamak al-Khuzai. Fantastic companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They went to Rashid al Hajri. They said, Rashid, Maytham and Habib ibn Madahar are crazy. He said, What do you mean? He said, Maytham tells Habib, Are you ready for Karbala? And Habib tells Maytham, Are you ready for a day when you will be forced to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib? And both of them said, They're ready. Look how crazy these two become. He said, May Allah bless Maytham al Tamar. He forgot to tell you that Habib ibn Madahar, when they parade his head, the man will be paid 100 dinar for doing it. They thought this man's crazy as well if he's got this knowledge as well. As in Rashid, what was Rashid saying? Rashid was saying, you think they're the only two with that knowledge? Even I've been given this knowledge. You find Ilm al-Balaya wal manaya that was one incident. A second incident, Maytham al-Tamar was on a boat. On this boat in the middle of the sea, the narrations mention, he said to the head of the boat or the captain of the boat or the ship, he said to him, tie it quickly. He said, why? He said, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan has just died. They said, what do you mean Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan? And in these days, we have iPod, iPad, iPad, we have all of these things. Straight away, you know, if there is any piece of news, it comes to you. In one second, it comes. In those days, how do you receive information like that? If I'm in the middle of the sea, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan is sitting in Sham. How do I receive information like that? He said to him, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan has just died. Tie the boat, tie the boat. Eventually, the news came. Oh, people, we have news from Sham. A letter has come to us. What's the letter? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan died at this time, at this time, at this time. Exactly the same time Maytham said it. You found that was number two. Number three, Maytham al-Tamar saw Amr ibn al-Hurayth. 
When you saw Amr bin Hurayth, you know what he said to him? He said, Amr, are you ready for the day I'm going to be your neighbor? Are you ready for that day or no? He said to him, what do you mean you're going to be my neighbor? He said, there's going to be a day when I'm going to be your neighbor. Amr looked around, he said, but the houses aren't for sale. Abdullah bin Mas'ud's house is not on sale. And that house is not for sale. I can't see how you're going to be my neighbor. He couldn't understand. He was thinking, how are you going to be my neighbor? There's no houses which are going. You find that that would come true later on. That would come true. Why? Because Ali ibn Abi Talib had already told him. What had Ali told him? Ali ibn Abi Talib had already told him. There'll be a, that tree, Maytham. You see it? He said to him, yes, I see the tree. He said to him, are you ready for the day that the son of Marjana will crucify you on that tree? And he'll torture you. And when he tortures you, he'll ask you, denounce your love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Will you denounce my love or no? Maytham said, no, I'll never. And he'd go to the tree every morning and every night. And you know what he'd say to it? He'd water the tree and he'd say, oh tree, I've been created for you. You've been created for me. You find therefore, that was the third area. Then there was a fourth area, which was when? which was when Maytham al-Tamar would be placed in prison with Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Why? Because you found Maytham al-Tamar, what happened? Maytham al-Tamar had left for Hajj. When Maytham had left for Hajj or for Umrah, the narration states he went for Umrah. When he went for Umrah, where did he go? Maytham al-Tamar, when he went for Umrah, the narrations mentioned to us that he went to the house of Umm Salama, the wife of Rasulullah. Rasulullah at the time of Karbala, only one of his wives was alive. All the others had died. There was only one alive. That was Umm Salama. He went to the house of Umm Salama. He knocked at the door. When he knocked at the door of the house of Umm Salama, what did he say? He knocked at the door of the house and he said, Oh, Umm Salama, may I come in and speak to you? I want to speak to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. She said to him, I'm sorry, sir. Aba Abdullah al-Hussein has gone out into his gardens. He's not present at the moment. He said, then very well, I'm going to leave. Please bid him my regards and tell him I will see him inshallah in the hereafter. She looked at him and she said, what do you mean the hereafter? Why don't you wait and see him now? He said, no, I have to leave now. She looked at him and she said, what's your name? He said, I am Maytham al-Tamar of those who sell dates in Kufa partisan of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said, you knew Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, yes. She said, do you know how much Rasulullah loved you? He looked at her and he said, what do you mean? This is a moment he sheds tears. He said, so what do you mean? She said, in the night I would hear Rasulullah praising you in front of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he said to her, at that moment she looked at him, she said, Maytham, you should dye your beard with blood. He said to her, I know. I know there's going to be a moment when I'm going to be asked to denounce Ali ibn Abi Talib. And I'm ready for that moment. But please bid my farewell to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And not only bid my farewell to him, she looked at him, she said, You know what? Abba Abdullah loves you, Maytham. He would also mention your name as well. The narration said, Maytham went for his Umrah. Ibn Ziyad, what had happened at the time? Ibn Ziyad, Yazid ibn Muawiyah was sitting in Sham. When Yazid was sitting in Sham, Yazid, who was governor of Kufar at the time, and Nu'man ibn Bashir, father-in-law of Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. And Nu'man ibn Bashir was governor of Kufa. Yazid was unhappy with Nu'man. Why? Because he heard Nu'man ibn Bashir is not being strict. The people of Kufa have said, let Hussein come, we will help him. And Nu'man ibn Bashir is not executing anyone, is not killing anyone. He's allowing people to be free, to be loose. So what do the narrations mention? The narrations mention to us that he replaced the Nu'man ibn Bashir with whom? He replaced the Nu'man ibn Bashir with Ibn Ziyad, also known as Ibn Marjana. Sometimes people ask, in Ziyarat Ashura, we say Ibn Ziyad and Ibn Marjana. Why is it Ibn Marjana? Uh, it's as if purposely Marjana was mentioned because it was his mom's name. Marjana was his mom's name. And anyone who reads what her job was will know why she was mentioned. So what you find is that he was called Ibn Marjana as well, the son of an illegitimate birth. Nobody actually knew whose original father was. 
And therefore, what do you find? Ibn Yazid said, Yazid had an advisor next to him. His advisor was called Sir John the Roman. Yazid looked at him. He said, Sir John, I'm in trouble in Kufa. He said, how? He said, Ibn, uh, the Nu'man Ibn Bashir is in power and he's not really doing much. What do you think I should do? He said, there's only one man who your father would have put in Kufa right now if your father Muawiyah was alive. He said, who? He said, Ibn Marjana. Yazid hated Ibn Marjana. He hated Ibn Ziyad and Ibn Ziyad hated Yazid. Both arrogant men, both good looking men, both in their thirties. Why would they want to be in any difficult position? And Yazid did not want him to be in power. But Yazid wrote to Ibn Ziyad, Ibn Ziyad, go towards the people of Kufa. What's my role in Kufa? Go and exterminate any of the lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib in Kufa. Any of the lovers of Abu Turab in Kufa, go and finish their lives off. And that's why here is an important point. Why? Because when Ibn Ziyad enters Kufa, there are people who until today say, the people of Kufa, they're the reason of the death of, Ali, of Imam al Hussein. They say it was the people of Kufa who let down Imam al-Hussein. What are you talking about the people of Kufa? Hold on one second. The people of Kufa, when you say the Shia of Kufa killed Imam al-Hussein. Do you know in Kufa how many different types of people you had? There were two types of Shia in Kufa. A Shia, what does it mean originally? It means someone who's party of or the follower of. You had the Shia of Hussein, who were the party of Hussein against Yazid because they hated Yazid. Not because they loved Hussein. They hated Yazid. If Hussein's leading against Yazid, we're with him. But if any other person leads, we're with him as well. Those people didn't believe in Imam Hussein. They only believed that their interests and Imam Hussein's interests were similar. Then you had the real Shia of Kufa. The ones who believed theologically. Imam Hussein is the third of the 12 Imams chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to defend the message of the religion of Islam appointed by Allah in the holy line of Fatima, you find that those Shia, you think they let down Imam al Hussein? No, they didn't. Those Shia of Kufa, Ibn Ziyad, when he entered Kufa, he made sure that those Shia, who were the best of the best Shia, could not help Hussein. Do you know what Ibn Ziyad did? First thing, he gathered thousands of them, of the loyal Shia of Imam al Hussein, in a square called Kanasa Square. He gathered them, he tied all of them together and they were all beheaded in Kanasa Square. The hadith say Kanasa Square became a bloodbath. You tell me Shia of Kufa let down Imam al-Hussein? How dare you say Shia of Kufa let down Imam al-Hussein when there were people who lost their lives? Because of Ibn Ziyad, those people in Kanasa Square, they were what? They were beheaded. Then there was another category of the Shia of Kufa who were killed, such as for example, Hani bin Urwa or Abbas al-Jadali. These were Shia Imam Hussein who were killed. Then there was a third category who Ibn Ziyad didn't kill. He put them in prison in Kufa. Like who? Mukhtar al Thaqafi was placed in prison by Ibn Ziyad. Mukhtar, people say, why wasn't Mukhtar at Karbala? Because Mukhtar was put in prison by Ibn Ziyad when Mukhtar found out what happened to Muslim bin Aqil. Mukhtar tried to fight, they placed him in prison. Ibn Ziyad went around, he said, Where's Maytham al Tamar? Where's that lover of Abu Turab? You know, they used to use Abu Turab as an insult, not as a praise. Say the man of dust. Where is he? Where's that Maytham? They said Maytham is not in Kufa. Where is he then? Said he had gone for Umrah. You know, in that time it was the Hijjah, couple of weeks before Ashura. Where's he gone? Where would you go in the Hijjah? You go to Hajj. He said, one of you has to find him now. I want him caught. As soon as you catch him, you bring him to Kufa. They caught him in Qadisiyah. On his way from Hajj, they caught him and they brought him to Kufa to Ibn Ziyad. And the altercation that takes place is an altercation that causes goosebumps in the lover of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know why? Because he looked at him, he said to him, You are Maytham al Tamar, the one they say used to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to him, Yes. He said to him, Maytham, where's your Lord to help you now? He said, my Lord awaits oppressors like you. He said to him, where's Abu Turab now? I hear you love Abu Turab. He said, I do not know of a man called Abu Turab. Who are you referring to? He knows it's an insult. Who are you referring to? He said, where is Ali, son of Abu Talib? To help you now and to help his son as well. 
who's in a predicament. Maytham said, and Ali ibn Abi Talib is my master, and I'll follow him at every time. He said, very well, then I'll execute you. He said, it will be my honor for you to execute me while I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib told me that one day I'll be executed while people are trying to force me not to show love to him. But this tongue will never stop showing love to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He looked at him. You know what he said to him? He said, put him back in the prison. He went back in the prison. When he went back, they chained him. And who was next to him on the chains? Mukhtar al thaqafi He turned around to Mukhtar. He said, Mukhtar, glad tidings to you. Mukhtar looked at him and said, why? He said, because you'll avenge the killing of the grandson of Rasulullah. Ibn Marjana's head will be in your lap one day, Mukhtar. Mukhtar said to him, Maytham, no, no, you will be with me. He said, no, Mukhtar, they're going to take me now. On the 20th of the Hijjah, exactly you would say 20 days before Ashura, Ibn Ziyad pulled Maytham al Tamar out of the prison. And he laid him, he came towards a tree. Amr ibn Huraith, you remember Amr ibn Huraith? Amr ibn Huraith was standing there. He saw people bringing a man towards a tree. He asked, who is that man who they're bringing to the tree next door to my house? Said they bought Maytham al Tamar. He said, no wonder Maytham said to me, one day I'm going to be your neighbor, Amr. Please look after me. Look after me when you see me as your neighbor. Don't leave me alone. They bought Maytham next to the tree of Amr bin Huraith's house. You know what he did to him? Like a crucifixion. The first thing is he dug the nails into Maytham's body. And he said to him, now praise Ali bin Abi Talib if you can. And Maytham looked at him and he said, my master is the man who achieved victory at Khaybar with one hand. And the man who at Khandaq defeated Amr ibn Wid al-Amri. At Badr, half of the opposition were from his sword finished. And an Uhud, when all of them left Rasulullah, he remained with him. My master is the husband of Fatima al-Zahra. My master is the best of the believers, the commander of the faithful, the best of them in worship and the best of them in prayer, the lion of the Arabs, the master of the Arabs. He looked at him and he said to him, let the man talk, let the man talk. Maytham, the whole day and the whole night, recites the fada'il of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Whole day, whole night. Brothers and sisters, never stop reciting the fada'il of Amir al muminin Don't let anyone ever tell you to stop. You keep flowing. Because however much we try and enumerate, we will never understand an ayota of the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Maytham is there. You find there for Maytham, first day, then second day, until on the third day, Ibn Ziyad came. When Ibn Ziyad came, he said, do not let this man recite the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It burns me. That's it, end his life. Do you know what he did? He said, give me a knife. They bought the knife. He bought the knife towards Maytham's tongue. He said, let your tongue out now. And Maytham looked at him. He said, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me for the, my love of my master? You're going to honor me. He said, yes. He bought the knife and he cut the tongue of Maytham al Tamar. He then put the knife through his neck and pushed the head back straight onto that tree. Alhamdulillah, that night, seven of the fellow date sellers in Kufa came and took Maytham's body and buried his body until where it is today. And indeed, Maytham's legacy remained. Maytham al Tamar had six sons. He had Muhammad, Ali, Hamza, Shu'aib, Saleh, and Imran. These were his six sons great companions of Imam Zain al abidin and Imam al baqir You see how sometimes you leave fruits behind. Who look after this message? He had three grandsons. He had Ismail, Ibrahim and Yaqub. He had further than his grandsons, Ali bin Ismail, one of the greatest theologians in the history of Al Muhammad. You want to read in the books of Hadith? Read Ali bin Ismail, son of Maytham al-Tammar. Much of our theology comes from his narratives. In other words, make them use this tongue. He used it to make sure there's a generation which protects Ali bin Abi Talib, isn't it? As in, were it not for Maytham, would we know about Ali bin Abi Talib? Credit goes to Maytham what he's done. Therefore, Ibn Ziyad, when he went into Kufa, there were people he massacred. There were people he imprisoned. Maytham, two weeks before Karbala, he managed to kill him. 
And that's why Muslim bin Aqil was a stranger when he went to Kufa. As in when Imam al Hussein sent Muslim bin Aqil, Imam al Hussein said, Inni qad ba'athu ilaykum, akhi wa ibn ammi wa thiqati min ahal bayti. I have sent to you, who? My brother, my cousin, subhanallah. Muslim bin Aqil is his cousin, but Imam al Hussein sees him as his brother. Akhi wa ibn ammi. My cousin, I've sent my brother, my cousin, and the trustworthy one of Al Muhammad. With a message to go towards Kufa. But can you imagine how Muslim felt? Muhtar, prison. Hani bin Arwa, killed. Thousands of Shia, executed. You can imagine how difficult it was for Muslim bin Aqil. Looking around, may Allah never allow any of you to be strangers in a town. It must be the worst feeling to be in a town and you have no friend at all. And you're walking around that town. You know, he was praying in the masjid, originally 18,000. After he went to pray in that masjid, narration state he was leading 4,000 people when he was praying. By the end of the salah, 30 people. Someone says, okay, but you said the people of Kufa were killed. How comes there were some who didn't come with him? Those were the ones who didn't follow Hussein because he's an Imam. When money comes to them, it's over. That's it, we'll join someone else. 18, then there was three. By the time he left Bab al Kinda in Masjid al Kufa, he was alone. And he was walking around the streets of Kufa. And you know what hurt him the most? Wallah. You know what hurts him the most? What's hurt him the most? And this is the beauty of this man, I tell you. All his mind is with Aba Abdullah. He's not thinking about himself. He doesn't care he's a stranger. He's thinking Aba Abdullah will be a stranger. And I will not be there to be alongside the son of Fatima al Zahra on the plains of Karbala. So he was walking around. And while he's walking around, he's wondering, where do I go? Ibn Ziyad is in town. He's obviously looking for me. I have no house to go to. And he was tired walking around looking for some help. The narrations mentioned to us as he was walking around looking for some help. The narrations mentioned to us, he sat outside the house. Brothers and sisters, this next few minutes is difficult to narrate. He sat down outside this house. He was just sitting there alone. And this girl came out of the house. She looked at him and she went back to her mother. She said, mom, there's someone outside our house. I don't know who he is. The mother came out and the mother's name was Tawa. When Taw'a came outside the house, she looked at him. She said, excuse me, can I help you? He said to her, oh lady, I am thirsty. I beg of you some water. That's all I want. Nothing else. As soon as Taw'a went back, her daughter had stayed outside for a while looking at him. She just stayed looking at him, looking at him. She looked at him and thought this man's alone. She asked him the question and then she ran into the house crying to her mother. Her mother looked at her, she said, what's wrong? Did he offend you? What did he say to you? She said, mom, he didn't offend me. I said, so what's wrong? She said, I asked him, oh man, why are you sitting here? He said, I am a stranger in a town with no friends. I said, mom, how could they leave a man like that, a stranger? Surely he must have some friends. Surely he must have some people to look after him. The narrations mentioned that when Tawa came out, she looked at him. She said to him, oh man, what's your name? He said, Ana Muslim ibn Aqil. I am Muslim ibn Aqil. She said, which Aqil? He said, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said, my master Ali ibn Abi Talib. Are you the nephew of Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, yes, I'm the nephew of Amir al-Mu'mineen. She said to him, then come in my house, stay in our house. But she said, I'm so sorry. They're all after you now. And I fear they may attack you. And my son is one of them. He said to her, oh lady, just give me some shelter. If they decide to take me, then I'm sorry, I've offended you, I've taken up your time. He entered the house, her son came back. When her son found out Muslim was in the house, he went and told Ibn Ziyad. Ibn Ziyad called Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath. He said to him, Muhammad, Muslim is in the house of Taw'a. Go and attack the house with 300 soldiers. 300 soldiers against one man in Kufa, one man. He went with 300 soldiers. They entered upon the Muslim. Muslim came out. Do you know the narrations mention how valiant he was? From every angle they were attacking him and he'd attack them and he'd be able to push them off until Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath went back to Ibn Ziyad. He said to him, give me more soldiers. Ibn Ziyad said, what's wrong with you? 
I gave you 300 soldiers. He looked at him and he said, do you think we're fighting one of the green grocers of Kufa? We're fighting the nephew of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Give me more. He gave him more. Do you know this time what they did? In the beginning, they only attacked from the front. Now they decided from behind and from the front. They began to pelt his head with rocks from the top. They began to hit him with swords. He'd fall and he'd stand. He'd fall and he'd stand until someone with a bar came and struck his head from the back. He fell on the ground. Do you know what one hadith mentions? It mentions normally if they want to take you to an emperor, they'll rope you, they'll tie your hands and they'll make you walk. But with, with the Muslim in Aqil, you know what they did? They dragged his body across the floor in Kufa. They dragged his body. Can you imagine a body being dragged in front of the people? And you can imagine him calling out, help me, the blood is pouring out of my face. And they pelt him with the stones and with the rocks. By the end, Ibn Ziyad didn't even recognize his face. That's how much they had hit him. They brought him to Ibn Ziyad. When they brought him to Ibn Ziyad, you know what the narrations mention? When they brought him to Ibn Ziyad, the narrations mention at that moment, Ibn Ziyad looked at him. He said to him, you tried to attack me, you tried to fight me. Come here, tie the man up. They tied him up on the top of the castle in Kufa. As he was being tied up, he looked towards Ibn Ziyad. He said to him, oh Ibn Ziyad, I have three requests from you. I beg of you, honor them. He said, what are they? He said, the first request is, I have a loan which is outstanding. I beg you pay the loan back for me or let someone pay it back. He said to him, what's your second request? He said, the second request is when I die, let someone bury me an Islamic burial. Don't leave the body just like that. He said to him, what's your third request? He said, the third request is to tell Abba Abdullah not to come towards this area. It's as if his mind is with Abba Abdullah. Ibn Ziyad said, as for your first request, the loan will pay it. As for your request of the ghusl, nobody will bury you. As for your request of Hussein, Hussein will find his death. Ibn Ziyad brought him, may Allah give you all patience in this moment. He lay his body from the top of the mosque. He looked around, he said, push the body off. At this moment, as he was about to push, a Muslim called out, Assalamu alayka ya Abi Abdullah. Assalamu alayka, O grandson of Rasulullah. His body lay on the ground. Amma Abdullah walked towards Muslim's daughter Hamida. He came towards her, he said to her. When he came towards her, he patted her on her head. Why, Ya Aba Abdullah, why do you pat her on the head? She looked at him and he said to her, Hamida, 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 my daughters are your sisters and my sons are like your brothers. She looked at him and she said, Oh my uncle Abba Abdullah, has my father Muslim died? Why? Why are you asking? He said to her, why do you say this? She said, because when you pat a child's head, it means they become an orphan. As soon as he said this, Abba Abdullah began to cry because of the softness of Abba Abdullah. At this moment, you know who walked towards her? Brothers and sisters, this moment hurts a lot. As soon as she found out she was an orphan, one girl walked towards her. Sukaina bint al Hussein. Sukaina walked towards her, she came near, she hugged her. Do you know what she said? She said, oh Hamida, 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 now that you are an orphan, I'll protect you. I'll look after you, I'll make sure nobody comes near you. I say to her, oh, Sukaina on the 10th of Muharram, who looked after Sukaina when she saw shimmer on the chest of Imam al Hussein? Who looked after Sukaina in the court of Yazid when she saw the head of Abu Abdullah in front of her? One more narration, may Allah bless your holy tears. One more narration. Sukaina and, and, Hami, and Hamida, when they were walking through Kufa, a lady came towards the prisoners. When this lady came, do you know what she said? She looked towards Sukaina. She looked towards Hamida. She said towards all the prisoners, she said, may I ask you, where is the daughter of Muslim Ibn Aqil? 
They looked at her and they said to her, why do you want to know? She said, I have a message for Muslim's daughter. Just before he died, he said, send my salams to my daughter Hamida. At this moment, she came to Hamida. She said, is that Hamida? Yes. As she was about to tell her, she said, are you Hamida? She said, yes. She said, I want to tell you a message. Hamida looked at her in her eyes. She said to her, oh lady, before you tell me, I want to ask you one question. When my father fell from the castle, was there anyone to protect the body of my father when he lay on the ground? Was there anyone to give a wash to my father when he died? Inna lillahu inna alayhi rajiun. May Allah bless these holy tears. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad to allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. Raise us with Maytham al Tamar. Allow us to receive his intercession and the intercession of Muslim ibn Aqil in this world and the hereafter. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.